encourage you to tell folks that. Use it as a way to do outreach. If a service moves you, uh, that's an easy thing to tell someone. Hey, you should go to our church page and watch Sunday's service on Facebook or YouTube. <clears throat> it's a great way to connect with people and, and maybe encourage someone uh, in, in some area of life as you've been encouraged. Got some announcements to make. Uh, one is there is a church-wide business meeting, but it's brief. We have two items to vote on. I have pieces of paper I'll have ready after the service if you don't already have it. One is the safety motion. And then we got to discussing so much, we didn't vote on Sunday school and officers, though we already presented it. But we'll go ahead and vote on that today to put that to rest. And um, that's really it. Uh, it's not a full business meeting, so we can't take new motions uh, outside of those two issues. Uh, but we'll do that. And then we have a funeral today at 2. Uh, it's good to see the Pew family here. We're praying for them, and they'll be back. And we'll, So I'll be here all day if anybody needs to come in to deliver anything. I'll be right here. There's, uh, of course, the kitchen. You know, there will be a meal after this. Uh, so the, things should be open the rest of the day. If you're an usher, uh, I, I'm going to be here. I'm not going to be gone. And so um, that will be going on, and so we'll keep that in prayer. Youth will be going on from 5 to 7 today, but we're going to be up in the youth area, so there shouldn't be any problems with crossing over. Um, and so, and that includes a, a Subway Supper and uh, a video game room and then the mystery game like we did last year. Uh, and those of you that are part of that really enjoyed that. And, it's, and parents, we would love you to stay. Uh, sometimes it, it's interesting. The extroverts go to the video game and the intense gamers go into the mystery game. And so it sort of works itself out. Uh, but uh, come on out. It's, it's a lot of fun just to be together. Uh, you will see that the nominating meeting is at 11 on Tuesday. We're, we're really working on deacons right now. Uh, if you are not going to be in that meeting, help me out by turning in your answers before Tuesday. You can call the office and talk to Stephanie uh, or you can call me. But, but if you miss, it, it would be really helpful to know your answers just so we know if we're done or not, whether we need another meeting. So uh, please help me with that. Um, the CPR AED training, the sign-up list is in this hallway. We've got about 10, which is plenty for a class, but we're welcome to anybody. We'd love to have more. Someone has volunteered to pay for the $3 book that you would normally have to pay for, so you don't have to pay for that. If $3 is your barrier, we've just removed that. Uh, but we are very thankful for that generosity. Uh, but we wouldn't have turned you down. We want you to come. Um, it's a three-hour class, but you're learning the AED and you're learning the CPR. Uh, if, you can, um, if you can't go out here and sign up, uh, then tomorrow morning at the latest, call the church office and tell Stephanie you're... you're or leave it on the machine so we can call and order the books for that class. Amy, I want to say Rucker, but more. She'll always be Rucker to most of us, but uh, she's leading it. I'm excited about it. But let us know if you, uh, if you can just even just walk out there and sign it. That would help But tomorrow morning at the latest so we'll get the right number of books. Uh, and so that's a great ministry. I'm going to let Susie talk about the ongoing music. Um, and we do have some prayer needs. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and tell one of them after, we'll let Susie go first. Susie, if you want to come first. You don't have anything? I know Ann does. Uh, do you want me to promote the union? Okay, so the union practice is tonight and then Thursday and next Sunday night at 7 at Madison Heights Baptist Church. You see the information. The only plug I'll give you is this is when we all to come together as choirs. It's our second since COVID or is it our first? Second. But this will be the first. We really aren't worrying as much. So I'm thankful. You have not lived, if you love music, till you see a community choral gathering. It was one of the, we moved here the first Sunday in August, 16 years ago. And that was the first thing we did that month that just moved me in such a way. It is just gorgeous to hear that music. And the sanctuary there is very nice acoustically. And so you will be blessed with all that we've been going through to hear that inspirational music will lift your soul. Good morning, everybody. I just want to tell you thank you again for helping with clothes for kids. That uh, week they clothed 100 children to go to school, and that's two outfits apiece and a backpack with all the supplies that they need. Our church has done well, but this year you gave 24 pairs of jeans, so that means that you helped clothe 12 girls and I just want to tell you thank you again also there is a box in the connector building we're starting to collect supplies for shoe boxes 
We have about 40 to 50 shoeboxes left, and Women on Mission decided that we will not be doing shoeboxes anymore. So we'll have those out at the end of September to pick up. But if you're out like at Walmart, they've got all their school supplies on sale, like um, colored pencils or 74 cents, whatever. If you wanted to pick up a couple, you could just throw them in that box. So it's up there now. We just want to thank you again for all that you help us with. One, we will share in the prayer time more details, but one loss we had was last night, and, and I don't want to drop it at, in the middle of service. And, 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 and I know most of you know from Facebook or Sunday school class, we've done our best to try to tell folks, but I know if you weren't in Sunday school and you're not on social media, you missed it. So I just wanted to share, and then in our music time, we can, you can be meditating in prayer. But uh, Gary Hilbert did pass away last night. And so, uh, Barbara and the family need your prayers. We will share details uh, when, we, uh, uh, when we get them. I don't know any details right now, but I just wanted you to know in case you, and I apologize, I wish I could call each of you individually when there's a loss, but, but I do want you to know that as you pray. Uh, uh, and I did get to see him yesterday afternoon before, and, and it was a blessing to talk with him, and he expressed his love for his church in those final hours, and so you need to know that. Um, in addition to that, we are praying for uh, Robert Pugh's family who's here today. That service is at 2. Please bring food for afterwards. We continue to pray for the family of Roy Casto and, uh, of course, uh, for Davina, Larry, and Katie and the loss of Davina's dad, uh, David, and he passed away on Friday. So uh, I know there's a lot of loss in this place today, and I'm mindful of that. And so normally during the music of meditation, of it, it is a music for celebration, and it still is celebration because we believe in Jesus Christ who is risen and we do not lose hope even in
Good news today. There is a balm in Gilead to save the sin-sick soul. Today, as we come together and join our voices in worship, would you stand as we read our call to worship responsibly and then remain standing for the hymn, The Great Physician. I appeal to you, therefore, to present us as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. And you are our potter. We are our Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give these gifts to you. We, we seek for them to reach others. We are grateful and thankful, and we pray that all that we do will bring glory to you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
may be seated. He's shared some of the prayer needs already, but we will continue to pray for the um, family of David Williams, uh, family of Roy Casto, and of course today um, we will be honoring Robert Pugh. We pray for his family, and we're going to have the meal after the service. But I want to remind you, um, for Gary Helbert, the one thing Barbara wanted me to share was she has no room in her fridge right now. So please don't bring food to her house right now. She's pretty packed with that. But once um, there are other needs, we'll certainly share those with you. And we're praying for you, Barbara, and your family today. Um, also this week, uh, you know, one thing about getting older is the people older than you get older. And uh, uh, through the years, I've lost lots of professors and uh, people who, ministers who, who inspired me in ministry. And this week, uh, Dr. Tom Graves, who was president of the seminary that I attended and graduated in 1998, which sounds like a million years ago now, uh, passed away. He had struggled with MS for most of his professional life early on. Uh, was even had some issues when I was in school, and, and he did uh, pass away. We did get to exchange emails recently. Um, his situation had become pretty serious. He wrote a great journal article just this spring about struggles of MS that he had experienced and, and declining health, and um, just a fine example and, of a leader and a pastor. Um, so uh, that, that, too, I would add to our, as we think about those who are grieving today. But um, that I know many of you have been in that position where folks you've seen, who have, whether it be a coach or a teacher, uh, it, you hear that news and it, is, um, it hits you a little bit. Um, there are a lot of health needs too, and you see this on the list. We continue to remember all those that are listed here, and they all matter to us, and we're praying for them. Um, I know Les wishes he could be here today. He's home uh, today, so just want to pray for him and all, Jim Peters, who also is recovering for more dental uh, surgery, and um, all the other ones on the list here, uh, Becky Cash, and on and on the list goes. If you have a need that you'd like to add, um, be patient with us. We are in transition, so if something in here um, needs to be changed, let us know and call the office, and we'll take care of that. We will add, and we'll be happy to, to take names off if you feel that you're doing a lot better and you'd like, of course, everybody wants prayer, but you're willing, uh, would like to be removed from the prayer list, let us know. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious God, on this day where we've gathered to worship you, our hearts are heavy. Uh, some weeks we just get a lot of loss. Uh, all of us know folks that, we, that have, uh, are struggling, but, but this week has been a week where we've had to say goodbye to a lot of people. And so I know that weighs heavy in this room. And so we thank you for your love and grace that is with us when we have days like this. And then the health needs and the, the situations that we are worried about, we also lift to you. And so today we lift these names before you this day. On a day like this, it is important for us also to continue to show gratitude and thanksgiving. We offer thanks for the following. Gracious God, we are grateful. We are thankful. Even in the midst of loss and heartache and turmoil, we have precious memories we carry with us forever. We have the hope of eternal life, the reunion that we will have with those who leave us too soon. Or We also know that we have strength and peace and encouragement from the Spirit to carry us these days. We are reminded of friends and family who walk with us. Sometimes these are the times where we draw closer together and draw closer with family and friends in our church, and it strengthens us. We're thankful for our own life and the living that we are given. It is a gift truly from you. Each day precious and should never be uh, taken for granted. We give thanks. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit we pray. And all God's people say.
Scripture, Matthew 15, verses 21 through 28. Then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Gentile woman who lived there came to him, pleading, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. But Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. Then his disciples urged him to send her away. Tell her to go away, they said. She is bothering us with all her begging. Then Jesus said to the woman, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. But she came and worshiped him, pleading again, Lord, help me. Jesus responded, it, is, it isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. She replied, that's true, Lord, but even dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall off beneath the master's table. Dear woman, Jesus said to her, your faith is great, your request is granted, and her daughter was instantly healed. This is the word of God. A song for the choir, melody for the, tr the choir today too. Um, let's pray. God, we lift up in prayer the word that has been read, the songs we have heard, and we pray that today that this message will speak to those who need to hear from you, and we are grateful. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. There are stories about Jesus that, like you, I just love. The feeding of the 5,000, raising Lazarus from the dead. Last week, when I preached on Jesus walking on water, that would be one of the greatest hits. But then there are stories that when you read the Bible, you read it, and you kind of stop, and you kind of get a puzzled Look, and you go, do what? For example, today's story that you just heard, on its first reading, it's okay to say, wait a minute, that sounds a little harsh. Because we've been taught that Jesus is kind and loving, rightfully so, he is. 
But this story, he comes off not so nice. He comes off rude and not very welcoming. So what do we do with this story, and what does it say to us today? It should make us pause and say, what's up? Because I think we're in a room full of people who have been taught manners and not rudeness, and we know Jesus is a model and the Son of God. So what do we do? Well, let's be honest. Let's talk about it. The woman in our story that was read to you expected to be treated in the way she was treated at first. She did not find herself being shocked by that. That's the way she expected it to begin. It didn't end the way she thought, but it began the way she would have expected. She experienced rejection and was rebuffed often in her life. Men would not talk to most women that didn't know the woman, and certainly Jewish men would not have welcomed her as a Gentile. A woman in her day, and this is wrong, but it's the way the world was, was not taken as seriously as a man, and men didn't often spend much time talking to women they didn't know. And her heritage alone, as a Gentile, made sure that she and Jewish folks did not connect. Gentile and Jewish division was real, and there was bad attitudes and bad actions going both ways. And as I said, it was a world of division and sides. And even though we don't have the same type of division and sides, though we probably do in some ways, we're probably more alike then than not, we definitely have our division. This story quickly reflects upon a world that is divided even now. We have groups and teams who don't like one another and frankly don't get along. We have people in this room and probably in this community who may feel like the woman in the story and maybe you have faced rejection and you relate to rejection very well. And it may be because of life situations or whatever, but there are times that you have felt shoved aside. And maybe some of us feel like that's the way we're going to be treated more than not. If that's you and you've been hurt, I'm really sorry. But I'm also glad you're here because I believe this story is not going to leave you there. And I hope you hang with me. This story is not saying such treatment is right. It isn't. In fact, I think that is why this story is recorded and offered to us today. Because I don't think Jesus is going to say no to you today. I firmly believe Jesus will say yes to you this day. Jesus will love you even if you feel that no one else loves you. And that is the point of the story when you get to the end. The Gospels as a whole over and over show us the Jesus we expect. The Jesus who loves and welcomes and invites. This one is an outlier. It's different. And that's why we need to pause and consider it. So what's going on? First, the setting. In the Gospel of Matthew, we find Jesus, and by his geographical location, something is happening. He is seen in an unusual region. He is either in a Gentile area or right on the line of a Gentile area. This is the only time that he will be seen outside of Jewish territory. And I'm fully convinced that Jesus is purposely in this place for something like this to happen to teach something to us. Jesus is always intentional in what he does and says. He doesn't do anything by accident. And so he finds a woman there or she finds him a little of each. And she is a Gentile woman, a Canaanite, who in the Old Testament would have been an enemy of the Hebrews. And she calls out for help from Jesus. Now, how she even knows who he is is surprising. There was no Twitter or X, whatever it's called now, to follow. She would, that she would want anything from him or expect anything from him is surprising. He would be a, a Jewish rabbi uh, to her. These two groups just wouldn't expect much from each other. Now, I thought about giving you examples of divisions today, but that would cause your mind to go in places and not pay attention to what I'm saying. It really doesn't matter what the team business is. There will always be team team business. Let's just agree that we have division today. Why and how doesn't matter for this purpose of this sermon. Regardless, it's real. And the woman feels it. So she calls out for him to help her daughter who is demon-possessed. There's another little pause for you. My Sunday school class was about the demon-possessed man where they threw the demons into the pigs. I always felt sorry for the pigs in that story. What did they ever do? But in this story, uh, it, again, we think of this demon possession in the Bible. And I don't have time to even go that, into all the ins and outs of that. But the point is, whatever you think about that and today and so on, 
we can agree that she is in a desperate situation in her life that we can quickly see. And whether it's demon possession or something else today in the 21st century, uh, the point is there are people, including ourselves, who sometimes find ourselves in a very desperate situation that no one seems to understand or even want to relate to us about it. Basically, she has a real need, rock bottom. She needs help for her daughter, and like any mama, she is going out and trying to find somebody who will help her child. And at first plea, it seems that Jesus is ignoring her. Now, let's think about that. The disciples want him to send her away. They don't want anything to do with her. They don't like her, and they probably don't want her to be where... They probably themselves don't even want to be where Jesus has geographically brought them. They don't want to be there. It's not their neighborhood. These are not their people. Let's just go, Jesus. Leave this woman alone. And he hears that. And so he plays along with them. He tells them, yes, it is true, I've come to save Israel. It seems he is agreeing and saying what they expect him to say. But is he agreeing or is he intentional to get their attention? I think it's that. The woman doesn't give up. She begs, she kneels, she's desperate. And he says to her, and he's good at questions, he does this. He says, why should I help you? And he talks about should he give the children's bread to dogs? Children would be the Jewish folks, and dogs was an expression used for Gentiles. If you hear nothing else, please don't call someone a dog today. Expressions like that, though, she had heard before. Expressions like that were something she expected to hear because that's what she knew that a man would call her. But is he really agreeing that she is a dog? Is Jesus a bigot? Hang on. She challenges back and she says, even a dog gets crumbs. Then he says, aha, you have faith. And he gives her healing and hope. So what's up? I believe Jesus, if nothing else, he is the son of God. He's the Messiah. I'm with you all the way. But he's also a... seem obvious but they turn out not to be he is able to draw out of people what he needs them to see and the totality of scripture is very clear that he has never been a bigot over and over he reaches out to women and to children and everybody else that nobody else wants so what I think is happening up is that Jesus is setting this up to to do just what we want him to do which is to upend the very bigotry that they were worried that you're worried about See, Jesus knew what he was doing. It looks like Jesus is going the wrong way, the way of bigotry, the way of our world. But he isn't, and he knows what he's doing. Let me illustrate it with a story from the 20th century, if I can. July 17, 1938. Douglas Corrigan heads out in an airplane in his 1929 Curtis Robin monoplane. Now, that plane was not the greatest airplane you'd want to fly in. In fact, you wouldn't want to get in his plane. His cabin door was literally tied shut with bailing wire. He had two compasses, and that was the sum of his navigational instruments. His flight plan was to head west across the interior of the United States. West, extreme west, if you know your geography, even if you're from Kentucky, is California, right? I know that. And he was going to fly to Long Beach, California. But something went wrong. 29 hours later, he lands his monoplane near Dublin. Not Dublin, California, but Dublin, Ireland. Again, my Kentucky geography still works for me. If west is this way, he went what way? East. Okay, let's try it again. If west is, is, if west is one way, what's the other way? East. Thank you. You've got that. There's also, what's the other way? And North and south. You got it. Man, we are ready to go on a trip. So he goes east. He had flown east over the Atlantic Ocean. July 17, 1938. And that day they gave him a nickname, Wrong Way Corrigan, which he carried for the rest of his life. But did he really mistake the ocean for the United States? For nearly 60 years until his death in December of 1995 at the age of 88, he insisted that he was surprised to see the Irish. He thought he was going to California, and he never told the truth about it. But there is good reason to believe that that was not really what he was doing. There is reason to believe he knew what he was doing. Because he was a huge fan of Charles Lindbergh, the great American hero who flew across the ocean. The first solo flight across the ocean occurred May 21, 1927. 
And Corrigan, like most of Americans, was fascinated, and he was so fascinated that he decided to learn to fly. He paid $310 for that monoplane, and his friends called it the crate. By 1938, only 10 pilots had matched Lindbergh, and he wanted to be in that dozen, desperately. But the Department of Commerce inspected his plane and said, no way are you flying over the ocean in this rust bucket. Sorry. And they denied his flight plans. But he did not want to accept that, but he said, I will. I'm going to go home and relax. And that's when he hopped in his plane and said, my relaxing is they didn't say I couldn't go to California, so I'm going to California. And he landed in Ireland. He, went, he was straight-faced and twinkled-eyed in his insistence that Ireland was his intended destination. But everyone is suspected, and not everyone actually knew, that Corrigan had gone the wrong way on purpose. On July the 17th, 1938, he achieved international celebrity and was in that top dozen. And he was widely regarded as a hero of adventure and daring. Why am I telling you this? Jesus is like that pilot. He heads in the wrong direction to get to the right destination. He has to go one way to show you the right way. And he does that often. He knows what he's doing. He goes, how do I know this? He goes intentionally to a region where he's going to have to encounter somebody that is going to be an outlier, a Gentile. And it reminds me that the entire gospel, no, the entire New Testament, no, the entire history of Christianity is to start at A and keep going and that going means we keep including people who need to know Jesus Christ people who are not like us keep getting included we wouldn't be here today if it weren't so another truth is that Jesus talks to a woman he doesn't ignore her if he were a true bigot he would not even give her the time of day he doesn't he engages in her he's prompting her he's trying to get her to say what he wants her to say because what Jesus is doing is what he always does, which is what the gospel does, is to show the world the wide, wide circle of God's love. Now the disciples are a lot like us. They are biased and they are bigoted. And Jesus knows it and he needs to wake them up. So he says what they expect and then he blows them away. He does that with a Samaritan woman and her five former husbands. He does that often. Another thing we don't see, and I wish we did, is the Bible doesn't record the physical gestures and looks of what's happening. We don't see his smile, his gesture, or his expression. If we did, we might see a whole other story as he talks to the woman. I don't think he scowls at her. The disciples expect to hear what they always hear, which is bigotry. And she expects to hear what she has always heard, which is bigotry. But he shows us quickly that the gospel of Jesus Christ is totally different than that. The gospel is about healing and love, something bigots don't get. For if Jesus really didn't like her or want her, he wouldn't have helped her. I believe the whole picture is clear, and his disciples are seeing quickly what's going on, and the good news is the story doesn't end there. Jesus now, through his healing, shows us that the world can be better than it is. That our world and our community in Amherst County and Madison Heights doesn't have to have the division and the hurt and the loneliness. And so I say today, if you feel like an outcast, if you feel like you're hurting, Jesus is saying, come to me who are heavy laden. Come. If you feel out of sorts with God and want to come home, here are some questions I'll be honest with you you should be asking. First I ask, do you have love for God? Do you have a desire and longing for God and what God can do in your life? This woman sure did. And do you have faith? Faith is trust and stepping out. We talked about that with the walking on water story. She stepped out. She stepped out of her comfort zone. She put herself at risk because she believed that this man named Jesus would love her even though other people did not care one bit for her. She had faith. And do you have persistence? She persisted. She didn't just give up. Do we stay with it or just give up? Jesus doesn't want to leave anyone behind. All are welcome to come to the kingdom and join in the kingdom work. And all in the south from Kentucky is y'all. And y'all means you all. East Tennessee, it's you and's. 
Up north, they say you guys or you guys. And it still means everybody, right? The gospel story expands and grows. The church does its best when we reflect the work and the openness of love. And we do our worst when we imitate the division and the strife that's everywhere around us. And the communities our churches are planted need to do, need to see us do better. Because what's out there isn't working. Spend an hour on Facebook. Listen to people in the grocery store. There is such hurt. People want something better. And I'm crazy enough to believe God is the better. And so the woman sought Jesus over and over, never giving in. I think the greatest miracle is her persistence. Now God answers, but maybe not as fast as we wish. Maybe God answers not as fast as you wish, but we got to have faith to stay the course. So how do we make it? How do we do this? In 1997, the book The Perfect Storm became a blockbuster movie starring George Clooney and Mark Wahlberg. And I hope I'm not wrong on this fact, or I'll hear about it later, but I believe that was the first movie Katie and I went to on a date. I took her to a movie on our first movie date that made her cry. I should have not done that, but it was a good movie. We haven't seen it since. It was so sad. The book was written by Sebastian Hunger and was about the storm that took out the ship, the Andrea Gale, and her crew. They perished. Spoiler alert, but it's been, what did I say, 97? If you haven't seen it by now, I'm sorry. Hunger wrote it, a 15,000-piece article on it, which became the book. That ship sank in 1991, facing 99-mile-hour winds, 100-foot waves off the coast. Another ship was in the water that night, the Hannah Bowden, captained by Linda Greenlaw. Now, Greenlaw is the star in Hunger's book. She's the one who called May Day when that ship was lost, and she read the eulogy at the funeral. The author of that book called her, quote, one of the best captains, period, in the entire East Coast. Now, her life changed after that. She became an author. She took in troubled teens to raise, married for the first time in her 50s. She runs lobster boats and moonlight tours, at least the last time I looked her up. But she said this quote I want to share with you. You need the backstory to hear the quote. She said this quote, To survive on the water is to course correct. And she explains, You're going from point A to point B. You have a destination in mind. But tides and currents and winds can upset your course, and you have to adjust. You still get to the destination, but perhaps not in the same way you had originally intended. Our destination is to be God's people at work and to do God's work. That has not changed. Not pre-COVID, not COVID, not post-COVID. But how that looks can change a lot. In this room, we have goals and dreams for what we wish our lives would be like. We are at A and we want to get to B. And the route to there can be very messy. But know this, as we course correct as things happen, God leaves no one behind. No one. And nor should we as God's church. God won't leave you behind. God won't abandon you. God won't reject you. Instead, God will love you. God will be with you. God will be for you. And so I say as we close this out, have the faith that this woman has. Ignore the things other people say, even religious people. Listen to what God says. That's what matters. Seek God and seek God even more. God says yes to you. Will you say yes to God? Let's pray. Gracious God, we come to this time where we're only here because somebody said yes to you and said yes to us. May we take that in our soul and our very fiber of our being and become people who see that in others. God, we truly want to be who you've called us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our time of response is good old classic from my childhood, I Surrender All. If you'd like to come and seek Christ, to accept Christ, or to seek baptism, or be a part of our church, I welcome you. But I pray that as we stand, we, I always say that, I think this, but when we sing these hymns, don't be on robot. Listen to the words, sing the words. They are really a powerful commitment to God. Let's stand as we sing.
so glad that you could be here today. Um, I know it's a, a busy afternoon for many of us. If you are uh, helping usher or do a, anything with the service this afternoon, the building will be open uh, whenever you need to get back here. Stay right after for just a very brief business meeting, and then we'll let you go in time to, to do that. Uh, we will have the service at 2, so um, be here before then, uh, and then we'll have a meal afterwards with the family. Uh, remember, youth, you're meeting at 5 tonight. And uh, we will share online any of the arrangements of anyone else that we hear about, particularly Mr. Helbert. We'll share that as soon as we know uh, more detailed information. Um, it will be, uh, I'm sure, on our Facebook. And uh, then I'm sure it'll be in the newspaper, but you can call the office in a day or so. And I'm sure that when we know, we'll be able to tell you as well. Um, remember, Barbara doesn't need food in the house yet, but uh, I know you can reach out and show your love and grace as you can. Let's close in prayer. Gracious God, as we leave this place till we gather again, be with us and guide us and love us and carry us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen.